Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Carter. I'm making this global climate change video February the 1st, 2017. And this is focused practically entirely on the United States of America. Title, Surface Warming and Climate Change Affecting the Continental United States. I'm making this video partly in response to the new United States dangerous climate change denying president Republican administration and Republican majority government in both houses. Global climate change is not an issue to the present United States government. Um, this uh, focus on the United States I've taken from my September 2016 presentation at the Oxford 1.5 degree C International Climate Change Conference. Now, the fact is, the United States is in a committed climate change national security emergency with respect to human health and food production. I'm going to take you through this. It will be focused on food production and uh, show you why. So, what's this committed all about? Well, today we are at a global surface warming of 1.1 degrees C, 2016. That means we're committed to a much higher degree of surface warming and climate change than that. That's how the climate system works. It's called climate system inertia. We're actually committed to a global surface full long-term equilibrium warming of over 2 degrees C and we're locked into 1.5 degrees C by 2100 and here's the quote from the IPCC AR5 on the 2 degrees C and uh, this little image here is showing that uh, back in 2007 the fourth assessment estimated that we were then locked into an extra 0 0.6 degrees C by 2100 and the AR5 said, of course, well, we're still locked into an extra 0 0.6 degrees C by 2100. Here's a recent headline uh, to grab you. It's great concern to the United States of America. The um, uh, headline from the press release of the research paper was Drought, Heat, Take Toll on Global Crops. Uh, research was published January 6, 2016. And this is the um, uh, extract, the all-important extract. Food production levels in North America, Europe, and Australasia, that's the global north, dropped by an average of 19.9% because of droughts. Rough, that was roughly double the global average drop because of droughts and heat waves. What that means is that uh, the researchers analyze the production in these regions during episodes of climate change driven extreme heat and drought periods and found that that reduced the expected very healthy yields that we've been getting with an increase over many years now that dropped it by 20 percent after the extreme event was over the crop yields subsequently came up to the good healthy uh, results. But obviously under increasing global surface warming which we are committed to and we are being committed or I should say condemned to far more by the present uh, United States government is bound to increase heat waves and droughts as we shall find on the research which um, I'm going to take you through. These are United States food production maps. There are four of them. They take a slightly different um, perspective on crop production in the US so that makes it interesting. I'm going to use this one as the um, most representative and it's the easiest one to um, uh, to interpret and identify. Um, very simply, the more brown, red, the more crops they're growing there. 
uh, United States um, is the world's top um, food producer and the achievement of the United States in food production, in crop production and yields is absolutely amazing. It is a huge success. Now this is a very recent paper, um, January 2017. Um, this is from the uh, abstract and uh, press release article. The continental United States is projected to exceed a 2 degree C warming 10 to 20 years earlier than the global mean annual temperature. So the U.S., the continental U.S. is going to get to 2 degrees C 10 to 20 years earlier than the world as a whole, which means that the United States is very, very vulnerable to global warming and climate change. This is a paper from uh, Consequences of Global Warming for 1.5 2 degrees C. Now, these are the two um, graphs with the projections. I'm not going to dwell on these. Um, this one, sh this is for 2 degrees C and 3 degrees C. And for example, CONUS is continental United States. So when the United States gets to 2 degrees C is way earlier than the world as a whole gets to 2 degrees C. And at 3 degrees C, it's even more pronounced. It gets to 3 degrees C even more way earlier than the world as a whole. I think this makes it clear if we just focus in on what happens to be the 60% of the models. I brought the uh, dates, the horizontal uh, year axis up so that we can correlate the uh, timing with the temperature difference. So the blue is 2 degrees C, the red is 3 degrees C. The dotted uh, lines are the continental United States. The solid lines are the global average. So now we can see there's a very, very big difference. At 2 degrees C, the United States um, hits 2 degrees C way, way earlier than the global average. And if we look at 3 degrees C, the difference is far, far greater. Now, these are really, really interesting, and they are the best uh, thing that we have on climate change. Um, NASA NECS maximum, maximum regional annual temperatures. And there's an example that came out with press release in 2015. So what we've always needed to know, rather obviously, is the regional maximum summer temperatures actual temperatures, not global average temperature increase. We need to know though that what the real temperature is when the global warming is at its height in various regions of the world. And now we have it thanks to NASA in 2015. So obviously this is the big climate change impact to human health and ability to work out of doors and crop yields. It's um, extremely valuable information for risks of extreme intolerable heat to humans and to livestock and the risk of drought and increased forest fires. So next is NASA Earth Exchange and their downscaled climate projections of maximum daily actual temperatures. So they're very high resolution on the computers and the high definition on the product. This shows the world at 1.5 degrees C. The maximum daily temperatures in the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere and the summertime in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this is temperature degrees C. And we're looking at 30 degrees and here's why. The quote, key quote, the key quote is from the IPCC AR5 2014. Crop yields have a large negative sensitivity to daytime temperatures around 30 degrees C through the growing season, high confidence. Uh, that's been out there for many years now, and uh, the AR5 was very, very definite about it. Once you get to 30 degrees C, you're in trouble with your crop yields by the temperature only. There are many other 
global surface warming and climate change adverse impacts onto crop yields, this is just one of them, a most important one. Here at the top is that all-important IPCC AR5 quote on the 30 degrees C danger limit and the reference. This relates to a paper on the 30 degrees C danger limit uh, on the United States crops, looking at two of them here, cor corn and soybean. Very important paper published in 2009. And the finding was that crops in the United States were predicted to decrease 30 to 46 percent by 2100 under the slowest uh, SRE SB1 warming scenario. What that means is that at a global average surface warming of 2.4 degrees C, these two crops in the United States are predicted to decline 30 to 46 percent. Uh, this is the uh, actual temperature in degrees Celsius. This is a log yield. So this indicates yield, but um, it doesn't indicate absolute yield. So it's the best way for me to explain it is it just gives us the differences. Here, which is actually at 26 degrees C, crops, the corn crops decline precipitously. And the same thing applies to soybean at 26, 27 degrees, a precipitous decline. Here is that 30 degrees C threshold. So this is when that precipitous decline reaches the um, baseline zero of what the crop yields were uh, naturally when the, when the study was started off. I think it's more important in that fact to take the temperature increase just after the peak, which is 27 degrees is the danger limit in both koi and soybeans, because once it's in a uh, established decline after this peak, it is going to uh, decline extremely rapidly. I would say we actually shouldn't be using the 30 degree C threshold we should be using a 27 degrees C threshold. So here are the four maps again, and we're going to be seeing uh, this one from the FAO. As I go through these NASA next images of the United States, the uh, daily summertime temperatures at their maximum in July. Um, now, don't worry too much about the 2030s. These are, this particular series is from the worst case scenario, RCP 8.5, the um, temperature projections at the end of this presentation. Um, this correlates to a global surface warming of 1 degree, 1.6 degrees C from pre-industrial. This is a 1.6 degrees C world. There's the quote from the IPCC. There's the crops. Now, I put these exclamation marks where it's very clear that we're going above that 30 degree C danger limit. California, they're looking awful. And um, there is a very large, right, very large uh, proportion of the uh, United States um, agricultural regions that are over this threshold at 1.6 degrees C. And it's a lot worse at 2 degrees C. So here we are at 2 degrees C, and we're looking for this 30 degree threshold of danger limit to crops. There's the 1.5 there, and there's the 2 degrees C, and there's the 30 degree. So 1.5 degrees C is really bad, um, 1.6 or 1.5. And uh, 2 degrees C is awful. Um, this I found a very useful um, uh, paper for food production. It's um, sort of a unique paper. Uh, this is the average dry yield of crops. Um, so you, you get a more complete picture than um, the other um, uh, crop production and food intensity maps but we're using that other one, like I said. Here is the paper, um, uh, Drought, Heat, Take Toll on Global Crops. So there's more information about it there.
We're now going to extreme heat. We've been looking at maximum summer temperatures. Now we're going to be looking at on top of that, there's going to be uh, more extreme heat. This shows extreme heat frequency. It's from the IPCC AR5. And this quote I put in, it is virtually certain that in most places there will be more hot temperature increase. There will be more hot temperature extremes as global mean temperatures increase. These changes are expected for events defined as extremes on both daily and seasonal timescales. Increases in the frequency, duration, and magnitude of hot extremes along with heat stress are expected. That is bad, 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 right? Um, couldn't be much worse. So this shows the increase in frequency at 1.6 degrees C, at 2.6 degrees C, and at 4.6 degrees C. And again, you see um, a very nasty correlation with the um, best uh, food producing regions in the United States. This is an absolute shocker on United States drought. It's recent, published in November of 2007, of 2016. The title of the paper, Unprecedented 21st Century Drought Risk in the American Southwest and the Central Plains. So I've taken the particular years with various particular scenarios to give you a um, range of uh, lower temperature increases and upper temperature increases. So this one here is uh, United States at 1.5 degrees C, um, more brown, more drought, 2.2 um, .2 degrees C. Uh, um, 2.2 degrees C, um, there's hardly anywhere that isn't uh, getting some drought. And the western half of the United States is very clearly affected the worst, and Florida down here, and uh, California. At 3 degrees C here, and then at 4.2 degrees C there, where it's very much spreading into these uh, top food producing regions. Here we are looking up closer at the map of United States drought by soil moisture at a global surface average warming of 2.2 degrees C. Put a map of the United States in here. Now I want to bring your attention to the soil moisture. So anything into the brown is uh, uh, deficits in soil moisture and anything into the blue is benefit higher soil moisture. So apart from this very narrow band of the eastern United States, all of the United States, all of the continental United States, is affected at 2.2 degrees C by a loss of soil moisture. It's into the negative. Uh, it's worst in the American Southwest. It spreads up here further higher into the west. But if we look closely at this best food producing area, uh, this is also being affected by uh, soil moisture, negative soil moisture drought. Here I've increased uh, the contrast by the same amounts for the map here as for the soil moisture. So now the color change going into yellowish brown is well into the negatives on the soil moisture. So now we can see that uh, indeed the best food producing region is significantly affected by being negative into the soil moisture range. Uh, Florida is pretty obvious there. This is a, another study, different kind of study, which um, gives the same result. Uh, this is published in 2014, Global Hydrological Droughts in the 21st Century. And uh, this provides deficit volume, which is degree of drought, and also the duration of that drought. This is at 1.6 degrees C. This is at 3 degrees C. This is at 4.6 degrees C. 
So things are looking bad and they get very, very, very much worse with respect to drought in the United States. This is a different uh, way of assessing drought. Uh, 2011 from Demaya at the Center for Ocean, Land and Atmosphere in the US. And this is a drought frequency in a three degree C world. So um, uh, this will be the same, no change. Uh, pale uh, brown beige, uh, that will be double the drought incidence triple the drought incidence in the uh, dark red and, and the purple quadruple that's uh, affecting uh, Florida there in particular. i just like you can, to compare this circle surrounding the best crop regions with the equivalent circle here and the uh, very, very large increase in the drought frequencies affecting these uh, key food producing regions. This is drought from the IPCC 2014 AR5 and this, this measures soil moisture change. Um, best case scenario 1.6 degrees C, 2.4 degrees C, 4.6 degrees C by 2100. Um, this scale to beiges, to browns, to reds, um, that's more intensive drought, lower soil moisture. E even at the 1.6 degrees C, we're into most of the region is into lower soil moisture. At 2.4 degrees C, uh, now we've got very significant soil moisture deficits. And at 4.6 degrees C, it's awful. And there's the um, American uh, food producing regions for comparison. Now here I'm, I'm going to show you um, uh, world drought projection. And the reason is this is the most recent paper published in 2015. It's the most comprehensive paper. It takes all the possible uh, drought indices and ways of accessing uh, drought. And it's by the best experts, um, Zayu and Agnew Day. Um, magnitude and causes of global drought changes in the 21st century, low moderate emission. This is on a two point, this is on a RCP 4.5 degree scenario. This is a two point, this is a 2.4 degree C world. And it is a word that the world that looks very, very bad indeed. Uh, North America, United States, and Canada, drought. Uh, Mexico, severe drought, and Latin American countries. Um, Mexico is a very fine food producer, and uh, the North American continent relies on a lot of food imports from Mexico. Um, South America, a lot of food producing regions and drought have to draw your attention to this terrible situation in the Amazon of the most intense drought. So that's going to mean uh, awful forest fires and huge dieback of the Amazon with massive carbon uh, feedback amplifying uh, warming effect. Um, Europe, um, Eastern Europe, bad drought, Western Europe, bad drought, and even going into uh, the Russian uh, uh, grain producing regions, bad ground, um, including um, the especially good regions like Ukraine, bad drought, um, China, drought, and uh, some drought affecting Japan. Um, Australia, its food producing regions are in bad drought, um, awful drought as was anticipated in South America, uh, in South Africa. And a uh, bad drought in uh, in North Africa, Morocco, and those regions there. Um, now the green areas have more soil moisture, so the Sahel, as has been anticipated, um, uh, would get uh, better opportunities for growing crops. This is Saudi Arabia, which is growing a lot of wheat at the moment with irrigation. And here, 
in the Indian subcontinent, which is really the odd one out as regards drought. It, um, it seems to, um, to escape um, at 2.4, the drought hits that ever, that other big agricultural regions are getting. Now, uh, um, very heavy precipitation can be damaging, just like drought can be damaging crops and also waterlogging the land and uh, land degradation or soil erosion. But I don't know, I would assume that that's an improvement anyhow. Um, but huge uh, regions. And this is what the United States looks like at um, in that particular study at 2.4 degrees C. Not good. Here's yet another study. This is the last one. Um, this is increased dry days. That's another way of uh, modeling and looking at drought. And so um, yellow and brown increased dry days. This is at 1.6 degrees C, um, consecutive dry days. And uh, the green, uh, less dry days. So again, uh, southwest is looking bad. Um, but also our best agricultural regions here are also looking bad. And uh, up here, and up here into Canada is looking bad too. Um, with um, uh, projected increase in dry day. Now we can look at all these temperature related adverse effects of global climate change on the US at 2 degrees C to 2.4 degrees C. And bearing in mind that we are now committed to 2.6 degrees C, which is higher than any of these uh, maps show. So we're worse than is indicated on these maps. And that's because we're at 490 parts per million CO2 equivalent. Uh, Stephen Chu made a very good um, interview recently and making this on uh, in February of 2017 on uh, the situation with respect to atmospheric CO2 equivalent temperature and committed global temperature change. So we start off with the recent finding that the continental United States is projected to exceed a 2 degree C warming 10 to 20 years earlier than the global mean annual temperature gets to 2 degrees C. At uh, this first um, uh, map is the projection of the global average surface warming uh, affecting the United States, and this is at 2.4 degrees C. This is the map of the crops. So the next one is the NASA next. This shows the maximum summer daily temperatures at 2 degrees C. Next one is from the IPCC fifth assessment, and this is an increased frequency of extreme heat at 2.4 degrees C. And uh, this is drought as defined as soil moisture. And that's from that paper, Unprecedented 21st Century Drought Risk in the American Southwest and Great Plains. But um, uh, practically all of the United States at 2.2 degrees C is under a soil moisture uh, deficit into the negative range. And this is the decadal mega drought at uh, 2.4 degrees C. So if we take all this together, the United States is in today is in an absolutely terrible situation with respect to uh, committed uh, losses of uh, yields on its food production. Because of course, um, the temperature and the extreme heat and the drought uh, they all interact, interact and overlap, and um, things will be very much worse than looking at one individually. Uh, now, I've already said that uh, there are multiple adverse impacts of global surface warming and climate change on crops. And uh, this is a very recent 2016 illustration diagram from the FAO in a report called Climate Change and Food Security, Risks and Responses. 
um, the notation is very important. This uh, representation is of these cascading effects of climate change impacts on food security and nutrition. So all of these adverse effects, um, they cascade onto each other. They'll have uh, additive and more than additive, they'll have synergistic effects. So the final result on uh, crop yields on all of these adverse impacts together will be way worse than uh, one individual adverse effect, which is how the science assesses um, uh, food security and crop production under global climate change. It also says a range of physical, biological, and biophysical impacts bear on ecosystems and agroecosystems, translating into impacts on agricultural production. They have ecosystems here, and they have that there because natural ecosystem services are essential to agricultural success. Um, the big example, of course, is plant pollinators. I made a couple of notes on temperature. Lower latitudes nearer the equator, of course, exceed the crop temperature thresholds first. But this is labor intensive manual in the field agriculture. And so there's also adverse effects on uh, the labor side of production. The, this is important with respect to the United States. Smallholder agriculture, smallholder agriculture actually produces the, most of the world's food. Smallholder agriculture may be more resilient to climate change than large-scale industrial agriculture. Um, I should just mention uh, that uh, O3 is ozone, and this is a very important uh, adverse effect. This is tropospheric or surface ozone, not stratospheric ozone, and um, it is toxic to plants, and the level of this ozone increases with global surface warming. The evidence that we have now to date then is really overwhelming that the United States of America is in a committed climate change national security emergency with respect to human health and food production. Food production obviously being a primary determinant of human health. Uh, this is a disastrous situation for the United States and for the entire world. I put a map in here of the states. Uh, here's the global temperature projections on the RCP scenarios from 1850. Here's the same thing for the AR4 SRES scenarios. This is from pre industrial. This is from the IPCC AR4 as well. And it's how I arrive at the situation that. As of uh, January 2017, the world is committed to a global average surface temperature increase of 2.6 degrees C. I've had to use this one from the AR4 because there isn't a, an equivalent one like this in the AR5. The other thing is that the AR5 only uh, projects up to 2100 and of course uh, that's all very well and interesting but uh, we have to know what we're committing all future generations to after 2100 and that means we need the full long-term equilibrium warming and that's what this gives us so 2.6 degrees c is long-term equilibrium warming and as i said earlier on by 2100 we know we're committed to 1.5 degrees c so um, we're at uh, 900 atmospheric CO2 equivalent today. Uh, the IPCC AR5 very properly only uses CO2 equivalent, not only CO2. CO2 equivalent uh, accounts for uh, methane and uh, nitrous oxide as well as some of the other greenhouse gas emissions. So it rolls them all into one CO2 equivalent. So at 490 parts per million, uh, this shows us that at a median, uh, we're at 2.6 degrees C. We're, we're more likely to be above that 2 degree, 6 degrees C, much more likely to be above it than below it. So 2.6 degrees C I believe is a uh, is a conservative estimate of what our commitment is today